Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today I'm going to cover the Years of Lyndon Johnson series by Robert A. Caro. This is a set of four books that I read this year, and they cover books 8 through 11 for my 2021 reading list. Well, if you missed the first four episodes for this series, I encourage you to go back and listen to those first, as I'll be re- uh, referring to those a lot through this episode, and they'll just provide a lot more context into what's going on uh, for this series as a whole. I've linked to them at the top of the show notes if you need uh, quick links to get to those. Well, I just spent 120 hours of my life reading the Years of Lyndon Johnson series. That covered a period of more than two and a half months. I started late January and ended early April of this year, 2021. It took me longer to read this series than it took to read the entire Bible. And going into the series, my, my purpose for reading these books was not an interest in LBJ, not an interest in his pres- presidency or anything like that. It was mainly because I had heard such good things about the author. And, and yes, the, the author and, and this series, but my main reason for reading this is I wanted to read something by Robert Carroll. To the point that if he had written a four-book series on Pee Wee Herman, I probably would have read that as, as well. So that was going into the series. Coming out of the series, I have a fascination now with LBJ. And the crazy thing is, is that in these four books, There are 2,825 pages, and only 292 of those pages are with LBJ being the president. That is around 10% of these books where he is the president. And just going into it, I would have assumed that the majority of the the books would have been about his presidency. Now, there is a fifth book on the way, and I cannot wait for that to come out. I will get it immediately when it comes out. I will uh, cover it on the podcast, but that book is going to cover his presidency when he was elected in 1964. So this this series, the those final 10% of the, the pages cover when JFK was assassinated and he became president for that one year before he was then elected in 1964. That leaves 90% of this book about the years leading up to LBJ becoming president. And that, well, perhaps you're wondering what kind of a psycho would want to spend all that time reading about one person and then barely get into his presidency, especially when you're spending time with someone that was that reprehensible. And to that, I would answer this. This series is books within books. That is how it's been described, and that, that's the best way I can describe it as well. There are multiple books within each of these books. And what I mean is that there is content about so many different things. You are not just spending 120 hours with LBJ. You are spending 120 hours learning about history, civics, government, power, people, and that's the power of this series. So I want to read a few things that Caro says himself about this series and then and then get into the thesis for this entire series. So here we go. Here's a few things Caro said. This is a series of volumes that I call The Years of Lyndon Johnson because it attempts to portray not only his life, but his years, the era in which he lived, rose to the presidency, and finally abandoned the presidency. America in the middle decades of the 20th century, in other words. It tries most particularly to focus on and examine a specific, determinative aspect of that era, political power, to explore through the life of its protagonist the acquisition and use of various forms of that power during that half-century of American history, and to ascertain also the fundamental realities of that power, to learn what lay beneath power's trappings at power's core, end quote. In one of the other books, he said this, the, This biography of Lyndon Johnson, Johnson is intended to be a study not merely of his life, but of American history during the years of that life. So to that sentiment of why in the world would you want to spend all that time reading about this, this man, I, I get that sentiment. But from the quotes above, and as I came to see in reading this series, this is not just about LBJ. It's a much larger story. So the thesis for this book, if I'm, if I'm to take... These 2,825 pages, if I'm to narrow down these four books into one sentence, what would that sentence be? 
Before I state that, let me read the last section of the introduction of the first book, The Path to Power. And from that, I will, I will extract the thesis for this series. Here we go. This is Robert Caro uh, speaking here. It is not merely his skill at a secrecy that makes understanding Lyndon Johnson so difficult. It is a lack of knowledge about the land in which he was born and raised, the hill country of Texas. For all the patterns of his life have their roots in that land. Stella Glidden, editor of the local newspaper in the remote hill country town called Johnson City, and for almost 50 years the town's, the town's historian, said not long before she died, and here now is quoting Stella Glidden, so much has been written about Linden, but the thing is that none of it explains what it meant to grow up in a place like this. And without understanding that, no one will ever understand Lyndon Johnson. And without understanding that, no one will ever understand Lyndon Johnson. End quote. So my, th the, my, the thesis that I'm pulling from that, and the thesis for this entire series, the thesis that I am going to attempt to prove in this episode, is this. You cannot understand LBJ unless you understand the hill country of Texas. And here is the beauty of that statement, that you cannot understand LBJ unless you understand the hill country of Texas. That section I just read is at the very end of the introduction. You turn the page and it says part one, the trap. The next 138 pages are part of part one, and the trap refers to the hill country of Texas. Caro spends 138 pages telling you about the hill country of Texas and LBJ's forefathers. And as you read the rest of the series, you realize that this is absolutely true. You cannot have a proper understanding of LBJ without understanding the hill country of Texas. But the great thing is that that is just one of the things that Carol gets into in this series. So you've got the hill country of Texas, 138 pages. You've got Sam Rayburn that takes up two chapters. And you're thinking, why in the world are we learning about Sam Rayburn without, it, without even hardly getting a mention of LBJ? But then for the remainder of the series, you see how LBJ would not have become president without Sam. You read about Coke Stevenson, the person that, that uh, LBJ ran against in the 1948 Senate race. Coke Stevenson, Mr. Texas himself. You read about the Senate. In Master of the Senate, the first 105 pages of the book are about the Senate, what the founders had in mind for the Senate, the purpose it was supposed to serve, why election terms are every six years instead of four or two, like presidents and the House of Representatives, and what the Senate had become leading up to LBJ getting there in 1949. You read about Richard Russell. You read about human nature. You read about power. And all of these things, that, that is the power of this series. And the length of the series, the, the, that it spans four books, and the depth he goes into just increases the power of this series. Robert Caro has spent 40 years of his life writing these books. This series is just, it's masterful, and part of that mastery is in the title of, of the books. And so I, I want to quickly go through those before moving on to the next segment. So the first book is The Path to Power, and it covers 1908, when LBJ was born, to 1941. And these titles, there, there's something special about each of these titles. So in addition to, to saying the titles and the years that the book covers, uh, I also want to share just a little bit about each of the titles. So The Path to Power, the brilliance in this title is that LBJ knew the power he wanted. He wanted to become president. And he had in his mind the path to get there. But the path for him was too slow. He knew the power he wanted it, and he, he wanted it fast. Second book is Means of Ascent, and that covers 1941 through 1948. And the brilliance of this title is that, well, he is ascending. He's ascending in power. But most of that book covers a, a descent in power from 1941 on until he, he gets elected as senator in 1948. It's a, a, a period of kind of his wilderness years. And so for most of that book, he's descending in power until he ascends to power at the end. But as he's ascending to power, he is descending in character. And then the means of ascent, there, there's a huge discussion throughout the series about means and the ends and is it okay to have evil means to get to what you think is a good end? 
And so that title is, again, just a a brilliant title. The third book, Master of the Senate, that covers 1948 through 1961, when indeed LBJ is the master of the Senate. And the Senate, as we realize and you read in those those first 105 pages of the Senate, the Senate was not supposed to have a master. But LBJ changed things that had not been changed since since the founding of the country, and he became the master of the Senate. And that book is the one Pulitzer Prize winner of the series, and it is it is amazing. The final book, The Passage of Power, 1958 to 1964. I think of passage as being kind of a passive term, like it just passes to to someone from someone to someone else. So in this case, it passed from JFK to LBJ, but as we as you read that book, as you see, there was an active LBJ behind the scenes. It was not this passive passage of power. It was a very active LBJ taking the reins of the presidency in a very difficult time for the nation. So in the next segment, segment two, I'm going to dig deeper into this thesis that to understand LBJ, you have to understand the Hill Country of Texas. I'm going to dig deeper into that thesis. And then in segment three, I'll cover questions I received from listeners. And in the final segment, I will cover the one thing, my one key takeaway from this entire series. Now into segment two, let's dig a little deeper into this thesis that you can't understand LBJ unless you understand the Hill Country of Texas. Well, why is that? What is it about the hill country of Texas? I like to think of it as as a mirage. If you if you've seen those movies uh, where where someone's going across the desert and then in in the in the distance they see this body of water, and once they get up to it, it's it's just it's not what it seems to be. It's not even water. It's just it's a it's a mirage. Caro describes the hill country in in terms like that that it is a mirage. In, in, in this sense, you're, if you are a settler and you're walking west and you have just walked on straight land, kind of barren land, and all of a sudden you come to the hill country and it is green, it's lush, it looks beautiful, it looks like a great place to stop and, and put down roots. And that's what LBJ's forefathers did. They, they landed in... They, they stopped in the whole country of Texas, and that's where they put down roots. But it's a, it, it's a mirage because the soil was very thin there. And so a few things would happen. One, if it just got too hot, the, it, the soil couldn't produce. It would dry out. The second thing is if it rained, uh, it would often become a flood. So if you planted seeds, the, the, they would be washed away in a rainstorm. So LBJ's father, Sam, was a politician. And so he would travel to Austin. He would take LBJ with him a lot of times. And Sam was a honest politician. He would not take bribes. He would pay for his own meals. He did not ever want to, to be to, for it to seem like he was being bought. So he was the honest politician. And he was beloved by, by many in his community. And he made the mistake of, of buying into the Mirage. And he bought some land and he tried to grow crops on that land. And every time he tried, it, the rain would come and it would wash it away to where he had a mortgage on the house and he, and, he, and he lost everything. He could not pay his debts. And in fact, he died in debt. This is LBJ's father, Sam, died in debt. His father, having been well-respected and, and being had been a politician, had helped many people, did, it was a complete 180, and all of a sudden his family became the laughing stock. He couldn't pay for groceries, he couldn't pay his debts, and the entire family became the laughing stock of the Hill Country of Texas. It was humiliating to his family, it was humiliating to LBJ, and his main purpose in life was to not go that route, to not be put himself in a position where he would be humiliated. And so that's that's where it started. His mother was an idealist. His mother loved to read, loved to talk about ideas. And so LBJ's response to this, to this humiliation, to not ever wanting to ever experience that again, was to blame his father's honesty and his mother's idealism. And he was going to go the opposite route. 
Now, this is the probably the exact opposite response his parents would have desired, would have hoped for in their son, is to blame the very things that they were most proud of. But that's what LBJ did, and he became the pragmatic man. He became the man of action. He didn't care what you said if that what you said was not getting anything done. He cared about the actions. And that left an indelible mark on LBJ for the rest of his life. And this started early. This started in, this is when LBJ was a child. And so that's the amazing thing about this series is that the main ideas show up early in the first book. And while LBJ is a very complex man, there are certain aspects of him that were formed in that childhood in the hill country of Texas that never left. They were repeated patterns. It didn't matter what decade you were reading about, you would see the same thing pop up over and over again. And a lot of times that was amorality, that was uh, not not uh, being concerned with the legal, legality or illegality of the means as long as you got to certain ends. And the main end that LBJ wanted to prove that he was not going to be a failure like his father was to become the president of the United States. That was his ambition in life. He was a man of action. He was going to, he was going to do everything in his power to, to make sure that, that that happened. That's why the Hill Country of Texas, you cannot understand LBJ unless you understand that. That's, that's where that comes from, and you see it across all of the books. At the very, well, this comes up in the second, second book, but this is um, kind of for, for the re- remainder of, of LBJ's life. LBJ went back to the Hill Country, and he bought that land that his father had lost. Now, th- now just think about that f- for a minute. LBJ went back and the, to the place where he had been so humiliated and he bought the land. And today you can go to the Johnson Ranch in the hill country of, te- of, of Texas and you can, you can see that ranch and you can see it on the land that his father had once, had, had once owned. But LBJ did not derive income from that land. He derived income from a radio station. And he got that radio station through influence with the FCC when LBJ was in in politics. And that radio station became a place where he could gain political or others could gain political favor through him. So if they advertised with his radio station, they could get things done. So it it, it became a way to launder money in, in a way. And it was highly illegal and it almost got caught right before uh, JFK was assassinated but LBJ did not use money derived from the land of trying to raise crops. He learned from his father, but instead he used, he used money that was obtained illegally to buy this land. And I think it's just an, an amazing circular uh, end to that story that that place that he had been so humiliated, he came back, purchased it, but not with money from the land money gained from illicit means. It all goes back to the hill country of Texas and that you can't understand LBJ unless you understand the hill country of Texas. Now into segment three, and I'm going to answer a few questions I got from, from different people as I was reading the, these books of this series. This was on social media. I would just post uh, quite often of, of what I was reading. And, and so I got these questions. And then I, I just also asked for questions for this final episode. And so uh, it's kind of a, a collection of those questions. First one is this. What are the not-to-do lessons you learned from LBJ's life? Well, I'm going to approach this in, in a little different way and, and say, based on what I learned about how LBJ manipulated people, the media, the, the voters all that, here are some things to look out for. Uh, here are the, the ways to not, uh, I guess, to get around ways that, that you could be manipulated. And the first is this, don't look at what a politician says, look at what they have done. Look at their voting record and what they have done in their life. I mean, just reading these series of books, 
LBJ would just say the the craziest things, and and all the media outlets would would pick it up and 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 present it, uh, in in on his stump speeches and all that. He would just say different things, and 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 a lot of it was was completely untrue. But if you had had gone back and looked at his life, if you if you had looked at his voting record, and you had looked at what he had done, you would have seen a different person. And in fact, he would attack in that 1948 Senate race. He would attack Coke Stevenson for doing things that. Coke Stevenson had never done, but LBJ had actually done. So if you had known that about his record, you, you, you would know, okay, this guy, this guy's actually putting stuff on this guy that he has done, that he's trying to, to get the focus off of him. And so that, that's one thing. Just don't, just don't ever look at what, a, uh, or, or listen to what a politician says, look at what they have done in their voting record and what they've done in their life. Second thing, read the bills. Read the source material. So if there is a bill being put forward, again, LBJ would 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 say what's in the bill and it was not what's in the bill. And and but that's what would get picked up in in the news media. He would say his interpretation of that bill or that that thing going forward in in the government. So the important thing here is just to, to read the actual bill, read, read it for yourself instead of trying to, to just listen to what other people are telling you is what is what is in the bill. Read the source material. And the last thing is just to understand how things were set up to work and how they've been changed. And, and part of you, that you get in the, in the third book, Master of the Senate, you see how the Senate was set up, how it was supposed to work, and you see what LBJ turned it into. And just to understand those differences is, is really important. Second question is this, what do you think about the ends over means approach throughout his career? What do you think about the ends over means approach throughout his career? Now, I, I had highlighted this briefly um, a little earlier, just, you know, that the ends, he, he was all about the ends. And, and if the, the means to get there were evil, that was okay, because it was, it was, it was a good end or what he thought was going to be a good end. And, and for him, it, it was the end to become president. So for him, that was his, his end. And so what do you think about, what, what do I think about that? And, and the, the struggle, I guess, in, in reading this series is that, what do I think about it? Well, it, it worked. The evil means to get to the ends he wanted, it worked. And that's the shocking, disturbing, and amazing thing about it. He said he wanted to become president, and he became president. There were so many close calls in this book, close elections, health problems, any number of decisions that could have completely derailed his plan. And even how he ended up getting to the president was not his plan. He, he, he was at the point where he, he was thinking he probably would never get it. The Kennedys were in power uh, after JFK. Probably You're probably looking at eight years JFK. After him, it's probably going to be RFK another eight years. LBJ would have been too old to run again. So <laughs> that's the first thing of what do I think about his, the, his ends over means approach is that it worked. And that's just the craziest thing you can't believe the whole time you're reading you can't believe that it worked but it it did but then you take a deeper look and you see what happened that he escalated vietnam and and so you've got tens of thousands of people dead uh so and and that's when he was president and you and you could point to that and see and say see you know this guy who was using evil means to get to this end of becoming president well the evil means caught up with him and and you know look at all the carnage he he caused and the death in in vietnam and and yeah but then you could also say but he pushed through civil rights legislation as well and so it's a really complex thing and the best way i know to get around that is to to think that the civil rights was was inevitable uh, maybe not as fast as LBJ got it through, but the tide was shifting. And the only reason LBJ got on that tide was because of his personal ambition. And that was going to push him forward. And so it was, the, it was, it was shifting. This tide was shifting because of, ironically, because of the idealists, which LBJ hated, not because of the politicians. He got it, he got it through as a politician, but the tide that that even caused him to take that up for himself after previously not voting ever for civil rights, 100% against civil rights before that for 20 years. He's the guy that got the civil rights through. The ends over the means elevated him, uh, but he wasn't about some greater cause unless it elevated him. So what do I think about his ends over means approach? 
it worked, it was complex, it was complicated, and it's something I keep thinking about because it, it just was so wild. Next question, what are some life-changing quotes you noted from the series? The one that keeps coming back to mind is the one I pulled out for for that thesis where, where kind of paraphrasing, it's just you can't understand LBJ unless you understand the hill country of Texas. Because there are so many ramifications for that. I mean, you, you think of all the other books about LBJ that, that perhaps started when he was a president, but didn't go back to his early years. And you're missing an understanding of the man by not having that. And that's the thing that, that's the quote that just keeps coming back. And, and Robert Kerr would have some great reviews and uh, it, kind of sum up in a paragraph a, a lot of, of what was happening in the books. And those were great. A lot of the quotes, though, that did stick out were from people talking about LBJ. So Martin Luther King Jr. talking about L, uh, LBJ. I highlighted that in the last episode. Uh, and just other people, um, uh, journalists and, and other people who, who nailed LBJ. I mean, they, they, they got him. They understood what was going on. But the senators around him all the time completely missed it and, and completely got hoodwinked by the guy. They couldn't see it. But some of these journalists nailed it and just figured him out right away. So those were the quotes that 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 stuck out to me. I, I highlighted a lot of those in the in the previous episodes. But if there is a life changing quote, it is just that to understand LBJ, you must understand the Hill Country of Texas because that sets the stage for this entire series, and it is a masterful series. Next question: What do you think about his no reading, all do- doing approach to life? Do you think he could have gone further as a person, president, and leader if he had been a reader like Roosevelt, Kennedy, or Lincoln? So just a little background on this question. Uh, LBJ was known as as not being a reader. Uh, in, in fact, there was a period of time at the ranch where it was kind of a, a press. That, uh, LBJ was trying to, to impact the press to show that he was this learned, learned man. And, and he would just kind of put like the classics on his bed and then have them take a photo of him with the classics open. So it, it looked like he was sitting there reading the classics and he just, he did not read. His wife would try to read it to him and, and he wouldn't even like that. He just, he, he hated reading and it, and it went back to his mother who read books and was the idealist. It, he hated that. And so the question, what do you think about his no reading approach to life? And <laughs> this is what came to my mind. If he had been a reader, that might have made him even more evil than he actually was, because he might have gotten more insight into human nature. He may have gotten more insight that he would have used for evil purposes to to get, to to further his agenda of becoming president and fulfilling his ambition. So maybe it was a good thing that he wasn't a reader. And I guess the other thing is that LB, uh, or Robert Carroll keeps saying, despite him not being a reader of books, he was a reader of people and he was a master at, at, at that. And so he could, he could see into people's souls. I mean, he could see into people's hearts what, what could trigger them, what could, um, what could cause them to vote a certain way over another. He would always be whispering in people's ears. And so he was not a reader of books, and maybe that was for the better because it may have caused him to be more evil, but he was a reader of people, a reader of men. Next question, do you think you will read this or refer to it in the future? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I, I think I'll read this again, probably at some point in the future. I will definitely read the fifth book when it comes out. And some of the people that contacted me as I was reading this series said that they have read it two and three times. Remember, that's 120 hours of your life, and they have read it two or three times. It was that good. Second to last question, do I need to read all of the books? And to that, I would say no. Caro does a, a brilliant job of reviewing m- the main information in, in each of the books. So you could pick up any one of them and, and be able to just kind of slide right in. So the answer is no, but I would say, do I need to read all the books? I would say yes, because they all build. And to understand LBJ, you must understand the Hill Country of Texas. And that is covered in the first book. And you might get a paragraph here and there in the other books, but to really understand the Hill Country of Texas, that's those first 138 pages of the first book. So I would encourage you to read all of, all of the books. 
Final question, how did this series change you? Well, it sparked an interest in politics in me that I have not had before. Uh, It sparked an interest in my representatives and in knowing who everyone is, in understanding how government works, in reading the the actual bills, in understanding the structure of the government, how it was set up. Uh, if I learned this stuff in school, I've forgotten it. And, and this was, so this was an epiphany for me uh, in, in a lot of this book, just one in just how it, things were set, especially in the Senate, how things were set up in the beginning. But then also just with the, 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 great part of this book is you're seeing all the inner relationships and, and committees and all these things that play a part in how a bill makes it to the floor and gets passed. And those are not things that you are going to discover in how the government was set up because it's not going to go into, well, this relationship led to this relationship and then this got this passed because this and this 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 dam that was being built in, in the West of the United States actually played a part in civil rights bill being passed because LBJ was able to get these people to vote for civil rights if he got them the dam in in, in the West US. Like those are the things that are not going to be in in your everyday newspaper or or civics books. But that is what you you learn in this book. So did the series change you you yes. The the biggest way I would say it changed me is is this. When I am talking to somebody now about political things, uh I I don't I don't know if this this is what happens to you, but like if somebody brings up a topic uh, I, I kind of think back to the to the best book I read about that topic, and, and kind of just think think about the ideas I got from from that book, uh, so that I can I can discuss that that topic. When somebody talks about f- politics now, the the immediate book that I go to is is this books is is this series, and that is the framework now for how I think a lot about politics, and. So much of what is happening now is is tied to what happened then in the '60s and the '50s, and so you 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 learn so much, and it can become a framework. So, how did the series change you? It, the biggest thing is that well, one the interest in politics, but then it also provided this framework from which to view political topics, um, people in power, all all sorts of things. Now into segment four and the one thing, my one key takeaway from this series. Now this was hard. <laughs> um, 120 hours of time and, and to just pull one thing. So what I did is I, I thought back, I've, I finished this a couple couple weeks ago, and I thought, what's the, what's the one thing I keep thinking about? What's the one thing when I think back to this series that I, I, I just can't get out of my mind? And there are a lot of things to choose from. There's a lot of things I'm still thinking about, but the thing that just comes up over and over again is that 1948 Senate race. And that is my, that's my one thing because it, it encapsulates so much about LBJ's life. He won that election by 87 votes. It is a known fact that it was a stolen election. Uh, It was blatantly stolen. LBJ bragged about stealing it. He carried a photo with him into the White House. He had it when he was a president that showed the box that contained the votes that got him over that 87 or got him over the mark to, to be the victor. Uh, that was in a runoff. He, he lost the initial election by a lot, but because it went to this runoff and then because he bought that election, he, he won. And there is just so much in that story. It's an exciting story. It's a, it's a tragic story in many ways. Um, the lies he did, the things he said about the other candidate, a, a lot changed in that election. He he was showing up in a helicopter. Uh, the the other guy, Coke Stevenson, was driving up to the courthouse in in a in a car just to talk to whoever was there, and and he won. Coke Stevenson won, but LBJ stole the election and and became senator. He he is likely never to be president if he does not win that Senate race in 1948. And so that capture so much about this man. He worked himself into the hospital in that election. He, he, he ended up in the hospital. He worked so hard, but it was that ambition driving him. It was that ambition to not be like his father. It was that ambition that started in the hill country of Texas. And it got him to win the Senate race 
by all means necessary, illegal, legal, whatever it took for him to win that. And that is the one thing that I just cannot stop thinking about. For this series as a whole, uh, I said this in another episode, but if this were a novel, it, it would have never been published because no one would believe it. It would just be too unbelievable. You would, you would have to put it under fantasy. The things that happened in LBJ's life, the things he did, the things that got him to the power he so desperately wanted are, are, are almost unbelievable. But that's what makes it a fascinating story. It's a, it's a deep, deep look into a man, and it starts early. It starts with his forefathers who went to the hill country of Texas and how that shaped this man, how he took lessons his parents never would have wanted him to take from their demise and became a sort of man that was feared by many. And he, he, he took control of things that had never been taken control of before. He ended up passing civil rights legislation, but also got the United States deep into Vietnam. It's an incredible story. It's still being written by Robert Carroll right now in that fifth book, and I cannot wait to read that. I hope you will read this series at some point in your life. 120 hours. Um, just look at how much time you, you spend watching TV or, or on your phone, and you can find you can find that time. It is worth it to read to read this series. And I think you will really enjoy it. I think it'll give you insight into our current state of politics. I think it'll give you insight into human nature, into people, into civics, how the media works, how the government works, uh, elections. It, it, it just covers so many topics and it is so brilliantly put together that I would consider this a must read. It is my favorite type of book, one where you are seeing one life kind of filter through all different parts of, of history. I, I love that because I know little bits and pieces about all these things, but you see it woven together in a, in a masterful way. I got the closest I've ever gotten to crying while reading a book when I read about the assassination of JFK and just the personal ramifications for that. You had the office of the president, you had those duties that had to be taken care of, but you also had Jackie Kennedy and you had RFK and just the devastation. But while they're in, in just total grief, they're having to also look at JFK as, as the office, as the office of the president and just how heart wrenching that was to, to read through that, the, the human cost of that. If you do read it, uh, or if you have read it, I hope, I hope you'll contact me. Let me know what you, what you thought about the series and things that you pulled out of it that, uh, that I missed. I would, I would love to hear that. So please do email me. You can email me at eric at books of titans.com. You can also follow books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. And the website is stocked full of resources to help you find and create your own reading list. I'll be back in a couple weeks with the next episode of the podcast. And until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.